Hi, everyone. Welcome to this event, uh, What's in a Publishing Contract, co-organized by uh, Ethos Book and Books and uh, Gaudy Boy. <clears throat> Uh, my name is uh, Ko Ji Leong. I'm the publisher and the editor-in-chief of Gaudi Boy and your moderator for this event. Right, please be aware that this event is being recorded and will be made available online afterwards. Established in 1997, Ethos Books is an independent publisher of literary fiction, non-fiction and poetry based in Singapore. Gaudi Boy is the publishing arm of New York City-based literary nonprofit Singapore Unbound. Established in 2018, Gordy Boy publishes poetry, fiction, and literary nonfiction in English and in translation by writers of Asian heritage residing anywhere in the world. Our panelists tonight are Nka Ge, the publisher of Ethos Books, Kimberly Lim, the managing editor of Gordy Boy, and the Singaporean poet and lawyer, Gerald Yum. We want to thank them so much for actually joining us for this event tonight. Ethos Books and Gaudi Boy are holding this event because we realize that there is a basic lack of information for Singaporean authors about publishing contracts. In fact, new authors may not even know that they should have a contract before turning over their work to publishers. Ethos Books and Gaudi Boy are thus holding this event as a form of service to the literary community in Singapore, in the hope of informing authors such as yourselves, sharing best practices with one another, and listening to your questions and feedback for our own continuous improvement. We certainly do not believe that what we have right now or will share tonight is perfect, but we do want to share our current thinking and practice about publishing contracts with you in order to initiate a larger conversation about professionalization of the publishing industry in Singapore. For us, good publishing practices are not only good for the publisher and the author, but also good for the entire literary ecosystem. Publishing contracts are private legal documents between the publisher, the legal owner of the press, and the author, the legal owner of your work. Because publishing contracts are private, we won't be sharing specific contracts, but rather a standard contract that we use. Actual contracts differ slightly for different authors, partly because contracts are the results of negotiations between publishers and authors. The key idea here is that contracts can be negotiated the first offer by your publisher is not set in stone. An author can ask for more favorable terms if they bring more to the table. For example, a better work or a greater following. As Kage and Kim share about their standard publishing contracts, you will notice differences in the thinking behind the contracts and the language used in the contracts. This is to be expected. The two presses have very different publishing goals and programs. Ethos Books publishes seven to 10 books in a year, whereas Gordy Boy publishes only three to four books in a year. They have different publishing histories. Ethos Books was established in 1997, whereas Gordy Boy was established in 2018. They are run differently. Ethos Books is an imprint of page setters which is a commercial entity, whereas Gaudi Boy is run by unpaid volunteers who receive a stipend. They have two very different markets. For Ethos Books, mainly Singapore and Southeast Asia. For Gaudi Boy, mainly the US. They are also governed by different laws. Ethos Books by the laws of Singapore, Gaudi Boy by the laws of the state of New York. So any comparisons between the two standard contracts must take all these differences into account. In fact, we want to learn from these differences to see how we can improve ourselves. Whatever we share tonight must not be taken as legal advice. We are sharing from our knowledge base, including Gerald, our lawyer at this meeting, but we are not providing legal advice. 
We hope that you will hear many things tonight that will be helpful to you. But if you have questions about your contract, you should seek proper legal help. The format for this event is as follows. Kage will speak first about Ethos folks, followed by Kim about Gordy Boy. We think their presentations will answer many of your questions. Then Gerald will comment on the two presentations. After Gerald's comments, I will begin the Q&A with the questions that you have sent in. You, we do have many, many questions that you have sent in. So I beg for your patience before we get to your question. As the conversation develops, you may have more questions, follow-up questions. Please type your questions in the chat. I ask that we reserve the chat for questions only and not for side comments so that we can read and get to all the questions easily. The focus of this event is on the publishing contract. So we will be fielding questions only on the publishing contract and not general questions about publishing, such as how to get published. We're looking forward to a constructive dialogue with everyone, a dialogue that will expand all our understanding of how publishing works for Singaporean authors. And now we will hear from uh, Kage about Ethos Books. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jilion, for a very comprehensive uh, start. And uh, I wholeheartedly support uh, your like framing of this as service to the community because we are part of a larger community and the lack of knowledge of one, right, will be the lack of like, uh, like knowledge and good practice for the entire industry. So uh, I will go straight into a presentation which will set out what is in a publishing contract. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, can I check that I am on the first page? Okay. Yes, you yeah. are. Thank you. Okay, so a publishing contract, right, uh, is set out in very clear terms. Uh, the sequence may be different, but the parts are typically the same, even across different jurisdictions, because you have the same concerns when you come to publishing a work. So what are the main parts to a contract? So the essentials are that uh, there are parties to the contract, the person or organization, you have the start and end of the contract. A contract with no start and end, right, is incomplete and is very dangerous. The work that is being governed by the contract, the rights and obligations of both or more parties, you have also declarations, right? I call them declarations because when you use the legal term warranties, you are not sure what that means. And then uh, you also have uh, like indemnities, which are exemptions. There's also this part that is about fees and all royalties, a fee being a one-off payment, a royalty being payment you get from the sale of a book. And you have uh, terms governing sale and licensing of rights. Clause, uh, the type eight of uh, a contract, right? Extension clauses, release clauses, termination clauses, these are, uh, this will affect the start and end of the contract. And the last part is uh, other terms. So I'm just going to go through each of them in a very systematic way. So who can be a party to a contract? So between a publishing house and you, the author, that's the two parties. If you're in an anthology, you can be included in a contract involving multiple parties. But for Ethos Books, what we do is we sign a contract with the editors and that is separate from our contract with each contributor because uh, that establishes very clear lines of responsibilities and obligations. Yeah, so if you are a children's book author, there's an illustrator. What can happen is that all three parties, the publisher, illustrator, and author are in the same contract. Yeah, and that actually is good because you know what is happening for each party. The start and end of the contract, usually we define that in terms of duration and you say 10 years from the date of publication, for example, because the date of publication may differ by the time you have finished the work. At the time of signing the contract, you may think that you finished the work by, say, uh, 2021, but then you take one year longer. 
So 10 years from the day of publication, for example. And uh, it is also possible that a contract ends upon the completion of specific uh, outcomes. So it could be a very commercial contract is if the author sign, uh, finishes doing a book, submits the manuscript, gets paid a fee, that's the end of the story, no royalties. And also it's good to note that the date of signing may not be the date of the contract being uh, starting because um, as mentioned just now, the duration can be defined apart from the date of signing. And uh, later we talk about extension clauses, termination clauses, and also uh, the, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't read my own slide, <laughs> sorry. What's the term there? Yeah, but anyway, next part, right, the work. Uh, this, the title may not be confirmed at the time of signing the contract, but there must be a reference to the work itself. So, uh, and it is also useful to note that uh, the work, is it the whole work or does it also pertain to parts of the work? So you can actually, as an author, say that I do not want my work to be split up. And therefore, the publisher will have to work with the entirety of your work. But of course, why do you want to do that? You must be very clear because the more that a publisher can like uh, tweak the work, the more that the publisher can maybe market it. So there must be that underlying understanding of the trade-offs. Yeah. Then there are also rights and obligations that are governed by the contract. So rights would be for a publishing contract usually specified in the following manner. Is it exclusive or non-exclusive to the publisher? So from the perspective of you as the author, if, if you grant exclusive rights to say maybe Gaudi Boy or Ethos Books, this means that no other publisher can enter into an agreement over the work. So it's exclusive to this publisher. And it is also specified that this is English we are talking about, but a lot of publishers, right, because they want to be able to promote your book in all languages, they'll ask for all languages, and they'll also ask for the part about territories, they'll ask for world rights, so that they can then, if they go to any book fair, they are representing your work in all the possible languages and uh, in all parts of the world. So format would re uh, refer to, is it the print publication? Is it digital format? Is it audio book? So again, usually publishers, they will sign the work on the basis that it is all formats. And the control over the design and production, the distribution and sale of the work, this, uh, this is actually a very important term that publishers will also need to negotiate for because uh, 10 out of 10 times, the author and the publisher may not fully agree over the cover, for example, and you cannot have an impasse. You cannot have a point where nobody gets to decide or everybody gets to decide and the book will never be published. So this is uh, the certain rights that need to be very clear from the outset obligations. There are obligations on all parties and the obligation from the author's end would be submission of the work. And typically the publisher would expect that the author secure permissions to include material in the manuscript. Because uh, if the publisher has to secure permissions, there may be incomplete knowledge. Is it uh, covered, we do not know. So we would expect that when a manuscript is su submitted, you have done your part in ensuring that you are like uh, clear to use certain material from people who may own the copyright of those material, for example. So acceptance of the work is on the part of the publisher. If we sign a contract, then is that already, is that already a commitment to accept the work? Because you must imagine that sometimes at the point of signing, the manuscript is not complete. But is the publisher then like, uh, I would say, uh, entitled to say that, oh, if the manuscript doesn't fit my expectation, we won't accept it. So that must be also very clear at the outset. It depends again on the situation because the level of completeness at the signing of a contract differ from work to work. 
and also the, uh, the obligation to read and correct the manuscript uh, and to look at the layout, uh, that it sounds funny that there's an obligation because I think you would want to read it and check that everything is right, but it has to be set out as an obligation because it becomes then a responsibility of the parties who sign the contract. And I would say that a good publisher must want this responsibility as well as a good author. The next part would be declarations and exemptions. So a declaration by the author would be, I authored the manuscript and therefore I own the manuscript. It could be that the author has written the work but does not own the work. There's a distinction because you might have agreed to somebody to do this work for this somebody and you have written the work. In a way, you are the ghostwriter, but that means that you're not the owner. So to sign a manuscript, you must have authorship and ownership. And the next part is a declaration by the publisher, which is that we must make sure that we protect the copyright of the manuscript and that we will consult with the author for certain decisions. Uh, typically, those are financial and legal in matters uh, in uh, nature because, uh, say, if the work enters into some dispute, the publisher wants to also check in with the author about that. Sorry, did I miss out any uh, exemptions? Exemptions sometimes are called indemnities as well. And for example, this uh, exemption says that if there are certain like uh, proceedings that result from maybe certain references in the manuscript, then the author will indemnify the publisher. And I do feel that there's a discussion later for this because uh, this territory can be quite contentious. Next, fees and or royalties. So fees would be one-off fees. And it's typically for ethos, we do that for anthologies because if there are multiple authors, right, we are a small team and our finance department will have a very big uh, like headache having to pay out uh, for everybody. And the amounts, because you imagine, right, the sale of a book is divided into so many parts among so many writers. So it becomes very minuscule amounts and to many people. And we just prefer to pay one off at the start. Yeah. And uh, royalties uh, would be typically for single author works and it would accrue and be paid yearly for in the case of ethos. And uh, for different publishers, the frequency of payment may differ. And I think most important is later, uh, we can share a bit about the thinking behind why we do it this way, why we pay royalties in the frequency that we do. And we can even talk about percentages. But more important is that for ethos, right, the thinking behind the frequency is also tied to our manpower. We don't have a big team. So yearly payments are already quite exhaustive already. So um, sale and licensing of rights. We have uh, this uh, clause because your work can be a portal to like derived works. For example, if somebody wants to make a film, so they will approach typically yourself, the author or the publisher. When you sign the contract with a publisher, you are deputizing the publisher to negotiate for you. And that actually in a way takes the burden of negotiation off you. So then there is a clause to govern what you get out of this like uh, arrangement when it does happen. So all these rights, uh, I'm very happy for the slides to be shared. So don't worry about uh, having to record. Uh, oh, sorry, we have a video of this. So you can look at this later. So um, there's this thing about uh, allocation of net receipts that I want to highlight here. So after sale of rights, there is a fee, there's a revenue, but then there may be costs involved in negotiation and there'll be bank charges, et cetera, things like that. So after you deduct all those costs. Uh, so for example, if I need to fly to a place to discuss a contract, then I deduct all those costs, it becomes a net receipt. So the division of the sale revenue will be after netting off those costs, and then you we allocate it, and there's a percentage that should be very clearly indicated. The next thing is uh, uh, extension release termination clauses, right? 
be very mindful that there will be such clauses depending on the type of work and the publisher you're working with. And the most important thing is to be to read through the contract. And for example, a release clause could be, if you look at this example, after five years, if the work doesn't sell well, the publisher will then be at liberty to tell the author, we might want to close this agreement. We will uh, offer you this release and then you can buy back the books at this cost price if you wish to. But if you don't, it's fine. But you are now free to take your work to other publishers. So in that sense, right, it releases both parties from the contract. A termination clause will be affected by certain breaches of contract, for example. So we can talk about that later. Uh, and an extension clause can be after the natural term of the contract, meaning the 10 years, for example, it could be an automatic extension into a specific format that can be also in a contract. Yeah. So uh, some other clauses uh, that will be a typical sort of boilerplate kind of a template for contracts is, for example, reservation of rights. I think this is important enough to highlight because if the rights is not governed by the contract, who owns it? And in this case, the author owns it. That's, that's uh, what is in an ethos contract. So then uh, confidentiality and this concept of proper law and jurisdiction, which is uh, what uh, just now Ji Leung mentioned, here we are shredding different jurisdictions. Gaudi Boy is based in the US, ethos is based in uh, Singapore. Yeah, so I think I've done uh, the first part already. Uh, now over to Kim. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim. Uh, I'm the managing editor of Gaudi Boy, which Ji Leung mentioned before. It's a small indie press based in New York City. Um, we publish, you know, we do have published in Singapore as well, but our main, you know, kind of uh, focus is here in the US because uh, members of the team are here. So I'm also going to share screen as well. Um, why don't I see the... Oh, I see it. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so basically, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, build off what Kage had mentioned before uh, very briefly. And also, you know, thank you, Kage, for sharing. You know, it's so interesting to see what other publishers do in their contracts. You know, like G said earlier, it's this session, you know, we are sharing and we want to be in service to the literary community, but we are also learning ourselves and also seeing how different publishers do their work. And we, ought, we love, you know, having this, having this occasion to be in discussion and conversation and seeing how we can fine tune, you know, our own contracts based on what other people do. So it's just so wonderful to, you know, be transparent about all this with all of y'all. Um, so... Basically, you know, key clauses, and you'll notice that a lot of this, you know, kind of overlap with what Ethos does. Um, some things are slightly different, uh, maybe because of the of, of us being in New York, of us, you know, being uh, a smaller press, like you know, all the differences that she described earlier. But you know, uh, there will be overlaps because, right, as uh, as Kage said, we talk about you know the same things and these are important, all important elements that you want to be aware of when you enter a contract. So, you know, number one, grant and territory, that would be, you know, uh, Kage has mentioned all of this before, so I'll just go through quickly, and then we can go in detail each slide later. Delivery of manuscript and acceptance, um, warranties, which, you know, Kage had called declarations. We have advance and royalties, which is basically your payment. We have subsidiary rights, which is what Kage mentioned were the, the rights that you would sell off to third parties. Then we have accounting, which is basically how you're paid, how frequently you're paid. Um, seven, we have author copies, which is kind of complementary copies that authors will receive when they enter a contract. Um, then we have a publicity clause. Um, number nine, we have a reversion clause, which is a Kage also briefly mentioned. And finally, you know, we have the typical governing law, uh, which describes what you know laws we uh, the contract is operating under. So first slide. Um, grant and territory. This is very basic, very important. It usually comes, you know, either at the beginning and it should be very, very clear. We have the term, which is the duration of the contract. You know, um, sometimes you have contracts that say, you know, this will run for five years, 10 years, whatever. Sometimes you have 
terms where if you take a look at this language below that I, I, I screenshot for y'all, um, author hereby grants the publisher a full legal term of copyright. Um, in the US, full legal term of copyright is the author's lifetime plus 70 years, okay, 70 years. Um, and this, you know, usually happens if, you know, uh, we want the, uh, the, the author and, and the publisher agree that, you know, the author will, uh, that the publisher will kind of represent the author, you know, uh, it, for legal term of copyright for a very, very long time. Um, for other works, of course, you amend that accordingly based on the different ways that the works are going to be sold, the different purposes, whether you know the author wants to release those rights or not. These things, by the way, all of these, you know, are terms that would be negotiated depending on what the author wants. Sometimes the author is like, publisher, we want you to do everything for me, you know, that's great. So it really depends on your needs, your place, the type of work, etc. Of course, we have exclusive and non-exclusivity, which is the second point that Hage mentioned really briefly. It basically means that if you're offering your rights exclusive, um, the publisher has the right to, you know, go ahead and, you know, uh, publish your work and you cannot publish the work anywhere else. So obviously, um, exclusivity runs with you offering the publisher um, the world territory because the publisher is basically the main spokesperson of your work everywhere. You offer non-exclusive rights if let's say you know you want to go ahead with your rights and your work and sell it somewhere else to another publisher. That's why this contract that you enter with the first publisher has non-exclusive rights. Um, we have territory which can be world, it can be North America for Gaudi Boy, <clears throat> it could be Southeast Asia for Singapore, it could be the Commonwealth for the UK etc. And then we have format which is you know, talking about whether your book is going to be in print form or if it's going to be an audio or ebook. For the next slide, so we have delivery of manuscript and publication. Um, you know, words here or language here would usually describe the work and maybe sometimes include a word count. Um, and then it would usually outline a delivery deadline. Sometimes, it, again, it depends. Some works come to the publisher completed and then you have language that says the work is complete. Sometimes work isn't completed yet, and then you have a delivery deadline where the publisher says, we would like you know, the manuscript to come in by this date. And we have acceptance as well, meaning again, like what Kage said, you know, sometimes for certain uh, situations, the publisher would want to be able to you know, determine what, whether the, the work can be accepted, especially you know, if it comes in and the quality is poor. We want to put in terms to figure out how the work can be edited, can be fine-tuned to make sure that it's publishing quality. And if let's say it's not, or if let's say the author doesn't comply for some you know, reason, there has to be terms there that you know, allow the publisher to be released from the contract, blah, blah, blah. Same thing with the, with the author. Let's say the publisher is not timely with edits, you know, um, there could be language in there as well, where the author says, you know, I'd like to go somewhere else with this, but that's rare. Um, we have publication deadline next, which basically the, pu the publisher would say, once we have accepted your manuscript, in 18 months, we will promise to publish, just kind of determining that they're not holding on to your work forever. Um, and then we have the fourth one, which Akagi also mentioned, um, author consultation uh, with regards to the production process. So once again, things like covers um, and all these things that are very sensitive, you know, authors want to have a say. And you know, what we at Gaudi Boy do is if you take a look at the sample language I have here, this is an example of the publisher attempting to accommodate, you know, um, the author's requests, but still maintaining control over what you know, the, the, the cover will look like, because ultimately you need to have, you know, someone to decide on it. So the language says, the publisher agrees to consult with the author with regards to cover design. Notwithstanding this prior sentence, author hereby grants the publisher sole and exclusive right to decide on every aspect of production. So this is an example of, you know, us working together with the author, but still having language in there to kind of say, hey, you know what, at the end of the day, you know, someone has to make a decision. Of course, you know, all this is legal language. When we work with authors, we at Gaudi Boy really want our authors to love the covers. So we're never like, no, you know, this is it and we're done. We always make sure that we are in conversation with authors to, that they are happy and they want their book to be represented well. <clears throat> For the third, um, we have warranties, which uh, Kage called declarations. And these are basically promises that the author provides when they sign the contract saying that I warrant that I am the sole owner 
of the work. I am the sole author of the work, whatever the situation is, again, it depends. Um, basically, you are promising, you know, that your work wasn't, that you didn't, you know, you're not infringing any copyright when you submit the work. Um, then we come down to permissions. I'll go through these really quickly. Basically, right, if make sure that you have secured any permissions that you need in order to, you know, uh, for when you submit the work, the publisher doesn't have to go around chasing other permissions, whether it's permission to use a photo, permission to use an excerpt, whatever it is. Um, extending warranties to third parties, sometimes language in the contract says that, you know, um, when we sell the work, when we license the work to, let's say, a, an audio book uh, company, uh, we want to extend the warranties to them as well. Um, infringement basically means that, you know, if let's say someone else infringes on your work, um, the publisher and the author would work together to you know file a suit or, and any returns of that, you know, there are uh, splits and the, the contract would determine you know, what the split would be and how all those things you know, uh, would be outlined. So you wanna seek language about that as well. And then you have an indemnity clause, which you know, as Kage said again, it basically you know, covers the publisher in the event that an author's warranty is breached. So if an author promises that, hey, my work is copyrighted, that this, this, this is my work, you know, I owned it. Um, and if we find out that, oh no, the author infringed on someone else's work, then, you know, the language has to be in there to cover um, the publisher. And we can talk more about that later as well during the, the, the Q and A. And here's some sample language again, author warrants that they are either the sole author or the proprietor. So, I can't read my slide as well. Sole all owner of all copyrighted material, um, blah, blah, blah. And all this is available for you online if you need to take a look at it again. Um, advance and royalties. So an advance basically is a payment that you would um, receive for um, your book. And advances are made, they're non-returnable and they're made against royalties. So, you know, when you have a book contract, you usually expect to see um, uh, a fee that you'll be paid outset and then you will start earning royalties as you go as the book sells of course but you will only be paid royalties once the advance is recouped so kind of thinking as um an investment money given to you at first and then the royalties come in later how am i how am i doing on time am, am i okay um g uh you're doing fine yeah okay okay so here's sample language again um pretty straightforward right Subsidiary rights, um, straightforward again. Uh, these are the rights that you would uh, license to third, that the publisher would license to third parties on your behalf. Things like foreign translation rights, audio rights, anthology rights, blah, blah, blah. So here the, again, once again, you know, like she said earlier, think terms in the contract can be negotiated. So for example, if let's say you're like, I don't want to give my publisher world rights. I have connections with another publisher in another place and I want to sell them uh, UK rights uh, separately. So in that sense, you would only give the publisher rights in the territory they cover. Um, and then you would, you know, not give them foreign or translation rights because you want to retain those rights to give to someone else. So, you know, once again, the, the elements in the contracts can shift based on your personal uh, preference and also the publisher's uh, idea of how they can do the best way, to best buy your book, how they can best market your book. Um, okay, so this sample language is pretty straightforward. I'm going to go to the next slide. We have accounting, which is, you know, basically language in the contract that would uh, show, show you what a schedule, what the schedule of your payment would look like. So you know when to expect incoming monies. Um, for Gaudi Boy, we also do once a year. Um, we do all accounting once and we uh, make payments then. Um, and this is just for royalties, not, not, that's not count the advance, right? The advance usually is paid when you, half when you sign the contract and half when the book is published. So this accounting is just for royalties. Um, there's something called reasonable returns that I guess, you know, I, I don't know if I have time to go into it, but basically some, okay, I'll, very quickly, some publishers will put a reasonable return on your royalties, meaning like they will withhold a certain amount of royalties just because in the book industry, and I believe the book industry is the only industry that does this. When you sell books to bookstores, bookstores have the ability to return unsold books to the publisher saying, hey, no one bought these books, I'm returning them. And so, you know, if you pay royalties to the author based on that, 
and then suddenly there's a whole load of returns coming back to the publisher, then your, your royal, the royalties that were paid to you are, do, are, don't belong to you anymore. So sometimes publishers will put this reasonable returns, okay? Um, there we go. Okay, next slide. <coughs> Author copies. This is a very simple um, thing, but sometimes, you know, when you make, when you do contracts with publishers, it's these little things that you want to look out for, such as language that, that says that you have the right to have, you know, a certain number of complementary copies of your books. You want to have you know, copies of your books. So we have this in the Gaudi Boy contract, and we also stipulate that you're able to buy back copies of your book at a discount. Okay. We have publicity, which is simple to language again, that kind of says that the author consents to use the likeness in any publicity um, and marketing details. It's pretty straightforward. And again, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, you want to change your name, whatever, these are the terms that you know you can negotiate with the publisher. Reversion, basically, once again, this is language that allows for what would happen if the work goes out of print or if, let's say the work isn't sold as much, that not many copies are sold in a given year. For Gaudi Boy specifically, we use this benchmark because we are a print-on-demand platform, so we don't have a print run. So, you know, if we say, let's say, um, X number of books are sold, and if less than that are sold in a year, then maybe we can talk to the author and say, you know, this is not doing very well. Let's discuss reversion of rights. It's very rare that this happens, but we want to put language in there to account for it. Um, so that's always the point, right? You want to make sure that things are covered. And finally, for me, we have governing law. Very simple. When in any contract, you want to make sure that the laws of, you know, the governing law is specified. And for Gaudi Boy, it is New York. All right, that's the end of my slideshow. Hi, <clears throat> thanks so much, uh, Kage and uh, Kim. Uh, may I now invite uh, Gerald if you have any you know, comments on the two presentations from a legal perspective to offer? Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks so much for having me uh, in this event. Yeah, I think it was really plugged a gap um, in the market just in terms of, you know, coming uh, to a publishing contract, I guess, um, with as much knowledge as possible uh, as a writer. Um, so I'm going to just, I've scribbled down some quick thoughts uh, based on the really helpful um, presentations that Kim and Kage made. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through my list. Um, and again, this is me coming uh, from both an author uh, and a lawyer's perspective. Um, I am qualified in England and Wales as well as Singapore, but then this obviously isn't legal advice. Um, uh, I think uh, what we're trying to do here is to provide a very sort of uh, fundamental uh, contractual understanding of how publishing contracts work. Um, so obviously if it's a highly contentious negotiated document that's worth you know, 250 million, obviously you would instruct your own lawyers on it. So this, this session is for, you know, I guess relatively low value publishing contracts, standard contracts for, for authors that won't necessarily need to um, engage lawyers on. Um, so I guess the first thing um, that I wanted to latch on was uh, what Kim mentioned uh, in relation to the fact that, um, you know, I think with, with, with legal documents, people sometimes get scared of it or intimidated intimidated by it, but it's not the be all and end all. And I say this because of what Kim uh, rightly reminded us about, and that's because, um, a, a successful working relationship between a, an author and a publisher is not based on what is, is written on paper. So, you know, like when, when Kim said, for example, um, you know, uh, Gordy Boy maybe has the right to uh, veto any cover rights or something like that, but but we want the they want the writer to be happy as well, right? So it, it's all about you know sustaining this long-standing relationship between publisher and writer. So we go into the contract knowing that you know we're on the same page. We've got the common goal of bringing this baby of a book to the market. So so it, it's it's unlike other situations where. Um, you know, the, the legal document itself is inherently contentious, it's inherently um, acrimonious. Uh, this publishing contract is, is not uh, an animal of that nature. Um, so this, the second comment that I had was that if we take a step back then, um, what would a publisher want from me as a writer? I think, you know, honestly, when I approach publishing contracts, um, it's, it, it's usually a red flag review. So I, I don't uh, look at it um, with the expectation that there would 
it would be a highly negotiated document. If it is, then there's something fundamentally wrong with the starting point in the first place with the precedent contract that's been handed out. Um, so um, things that I can live with are, are things that make sense. So from a publisher's perspective, they would obviously want warranties. They would obviously only want to publish work that I say I have written. If not, it will just be plagiarism. Like that, that is something you, you can't negotiate because it, it, it just makes complete sense. Um, from an author's perspective, it makes sense for me to uh, give publishing rights to my publisher, but I'm not going to transfer copyright or assign copyright to them. So a copyright exists, you know, um, at the time of creating a particular work, and I own the copyright as, as the person that created the work. Um, so I just need to make sure from an author's perspective that I'm not assigning any other rights uh, or, or giving any rights to the publisher other than publishing rights uh, specifically. Um, and then um, other things I look out for uh, would be, um, and I know that there, there are a couple of questions uh, later on, on on this particular point um, on indemnities. Generally, I'm a, a bit more uh, wary of indemnities and that's because of how they work contractually. Um, to, to bore you, you know, for five seconds, just going down the sort of uh, legal explanation. So warranties is basically uh, me saying that, um, you know, uh, the, the work is what it is. It is my work. Um, I own all the rights to it. And, and that, that gives the publisher comfort uh, into entering the uh, into the contract. Um, an indemnity is a pound for pound or um, SGD uh, for SGD uh, sort of uh, payment where in the event of any loss suffered by the publisher um, due to certain specified events, the author has to reimburse um, uh, on a dollar by dollar basis. So that's a bit onerous if we think that, you know, I'm only getting maybe 40 Singapore dollars of royalties um, a year. So it's about proportionality for me. Um, uh, so, you know, if, if it's, you know, 5% of royalties per title, $16 per book, uh, you know, I'd be lucky if, if my, my work sells like 15 copies a year. So I'm not going to sign up to, you know, a, a wide ranging indemnity that covers every sort of conceivable loss on the publisher's front arising from my work. So it's just being, um, I guess, wary about these concepts. Uh, but but also, you know, as mentioned, just, just um, having this common goal of publishing this work and getting this work out into the world in mind. Yeah, so those are just my quick thoughts. Sorry. Thank you so much, Gerald, for those very, very useful thoughts, uh, useful highlights that you've just given to us. Uh, do uh, Kage or Kim want to respond at all to anything? If not, no, we will go into the Q&A. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, so for all our guests, uh, many of you have actually sent us questions uh, ahead of time. Thank you so much for your questions. In fact, we have a long list of questions, right? And we hope to get to every one of them. Uh, some questions, of course, we've actually put together with other questions that they overlap with. All right. So I hope you recognize all right, that your questions are being addressed. Now, as the conversation develops with our three panelists, you may have follow-up questions. So if you do have follow-up questions, do type them in the chat box. All right, and I will keep an eye out for them and I can ask your follow-up questions for you. All right, so we're gonna begin this Q&A with a, a more general, all right, uh, philosophical question, all right, which actually came from one of you. And uh, this question is, you know, what does a fair contract look like for both the author and the publisher? So beyond the legality <laughs> that we have been talking about, which is so important, right? Uh, because we do not want to be tripped up by the law. Uh, what, what does fairness look like for both sides? I wonder whether Kage or Kim would like to take the question. Yeah, uh, Kim, would you like to start first? I'm good either. Yeah. And it is a very abstract and, and, and difficult question to put all, uh, to put a finger on. I mean, I, I would think that also, you know, addressing the other questions that come up, we would be talking a lot about this very concept because I think ultimately that's what we want to do or at least Gaudi Boy, I remember when we sat down G to, to talk about this, we wanted our contract to be fair. You know, we, we wanted it to be fair to both parties because it has to address both parties, but we wanted to acknowledge that, you know, many big companies in general in any industry writes a contract and it's like, how much can I get out of this contract for me? And, you know, when we were talking, we were really just of that mindset how can we make sure that we don't 
have this kind of you know thinking and you know again you know this this discussion is so useful because you know hearing what all of you say will also help to make our contracts even fairer and make you know changes that we need to make on our part so i don't know how to answer that contract that, that answer that question directly um but we will let uh, i'll keep my tabs on it i'll take a stab at it uh first of all right um just now earlier g did make a distinction between gaudi boy and ethos ethos is an imprint of a commercial entity so what like our team does right is we have a responsibility to stay alive as a publishing house and do our work. So I learned this from, I used to be a teacher. I didn't have to care about earning money uh, by selling things. I get a monthly pay and I actually am encouraged to spend as much as possible so that we don't have leftover budget. Uh, sorry guys, Singaporeans, this is how tax money is sometimes utilized. But what happens is that when I joined a publishing house, I realized that we have to balance the books. And so the fairness arises from a consideration of every single party, including ourselves. My finance manager last time, B. Chu, wonderful person who taught me how to survive with my team. She shared with me, if you are not around, then how do you even think about being fair to your authors? So I would say that to be fair requires consideration of all parties and their needs. And so for us, right, at Ethos Books, we think very carefully about the percentages and the amount that we give to the authors. And at the same time, I also have to think about like my younger colleagues who are thinking of making a livelihood in this industry. So my consideration is, can I encourage them sufficiently to see a future in this industry? Because if they leave the industry, we are left with only authors and no publishers, and that is not an ecosystem. So this is the first part to considering fairness, and I have to be super honest about that. And the second part is authors. Authors, you give us your work, and we are respecting the like endeavor that is every piece of your writing, you know, it's so amazing that you want to do this. And so what we can do is a fair contract will look after we have considered what we need to survive, we divide and we make sure that you have a fair amount. It could be 50, 50, 40, 60. Sometimes it also depends on, for example, I would say that COVID really caused a lot of problems for retail. So now even 50, 50, after we have netted off certain costs, it may be a bit difficult. So I do not know uh, how each of you are handling contracts. Some of you are already published, but please take note that different firms have very different bottom line and they have to think about that. But if you have a very fishy feeling that the publisher is driving around in a Ross Rice, right? But then I'm getting pittance, right? Something is definitely wrong. So that is the good sense that is involved in fairness as well. The last thing about fairness is, right, my editorial team recently brought out a wonderful thing to us. We have a contract that is a sort of a handed over over the years. And typically, contracts are sticky. You don't want to change contracts so much. Why? Because there are existing authors on them. And suddenly, you change your contract, and then the other authors are left floundering. So a change has to be for good reason. And there's a stickiness to law that I, I see maybe it's also not always the best, but it does mean that we care for what we enshrine in the law. So when we thought, of, we, so one of the editors mentioned that, can we like remove this from one of the clauses? The author shall indemnify, sorry, the author shall indemnify the publisher from say any damages resulting from the publishing of libelous content, brr, brr, the word libelous content. Then, then we had a very deep conversation and we say that, hey, Ethos books, we publish content that challenge certain status quo. And if we insert a libelous kind of like fear factor, who's going to submit a manuscript to us? And is it even in our interest to put that in? So we have actually taken that out. But then there are still other indemnity portions inside. So I think it will be a very like gradual process as we become more experienced and 
become more aware of the situation, but I, I would uh, say bring this to the conversation, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, I see there's a question in the chat, which is actually more related to payments. So I will ask the question when we come to talk about payments and royalties. Instead, uh, I will go to a group of questions now about uh, rights, yeah? Uh, because we do have a number of questions about them. And maybe there's a question for Gerald. Uh, what is the difference between copyrights and publishing rights? You mentioned, right, there is a difference, yeah? And uh, who owns what rights and who should be owning what rights? Is there a kind of standard practice in publishing? Yeah, so normally based on my experience uh, and um, I'm an M&A lawyer, so uh, we do we deal with like cross-border mergers and acquisitions, but um, a lot of the tech M&A that we work on, obviously there's a strong IP focus. So naturally, you know, we'd come uh, into contact with, um, you know, IP contracts uh, and, and IP rights in general. Um, so- uh, And by IP, you on, mean, of course, intellectual property rights. That's correct, yeah. Thanks for the clarification, yeah. So intellectual property of which um, publishing rights uh, and copyrights would fall under. Um, so I think uh, a, a, a sort of uh, very brief summary would be copyright um, exists uh, at the point of creating a particular creative work. So whether it's poetry or novel, short story collection, um, and um, that copyright doesn't have to be registered. It's just with the owner. Um, uh, so the owner is the writer. Um, and then when we uh, go to a publisher to seek publication of that copyrighted material, uh, we're essentially granting them publishing rights so they can do whatever they want in terms of publishing the work, but the inherent right to the work, so the right that, that, that the work is imbued with at the point of creation, that still rests with me as the writer. So, so that's a fundamental difference, I guess. Um, you could, um, we could make the distinction maybe uh, linguistic, linguistically, um, I guess, procedural rights as, uh, and intrinsic rights. So copyright is something intrinsic to the work. Whereas publication is a procedural thing. So, okay, you do this, you contact this, you, you market uh, this, this work in some shape or form. Um, so yeah, that, that's the main difference between uh, those two rights. And yeah, um, normally, I mean, yeah, I, uh, I, I would want to retain, you know, the copyright because that, that's the right to the work that's intrinsic to the work. Um, and then I would leave the publisher with their publishing rights. And obviously all of those publishing rights would need to be well-documented in, in the publishing contract. Yeah, and would it be right to say then, you know, that, you know, one of the publishing, part of the publishing rights is that uh, the publisher, you know, undertakes the defense of the author's copyright to his work? Yeah, that, that's a common clause that I've seen in, in my publishing contracts as well. And then there would also be a consultation uh, obligation. So um, I think, it, it's, say, like you say, in, in the event of a defense or, or a dispute, um, both the publisher and the author would be on the same side. They would want to protect the work um, against, you know, the third party um, infringing the, the work or, or alleging that there's been a breach. So in that sense, um, there would be a consultation, you know, there would be, um, I guess, a, a call to arms uh, in the contract where both parties that are technically divergent in a publishing contract would come together and then sort of, you know, uh, fend against that third party. Thank you so much, Gerald. Uh, the next question I think is for uh, our publishers. Um, and you have mentioned this in your presentation already, but we do have some, you know, it bears repeating and we do have some people who joined us late. Uh, can an author publish the manuscript with another publisher after they have signed a contract? Uh, actually, when you have signed a contract, uh, there is already a commitment and if it's an exclusive, Right, then no, yeah. Yeah, so the distinction here is between uh, granting your publisher exclusive or non-exclusive rights, right? Mm -hmm. If the contract actually stipulates exclusive rights, you cannot uh, publish with another publisher. Is that right? Yes, that's right. But if it's a non-exclusive right, sometimes there is also uh, some sort of right associated with first publication. So the first publication, may need to come out first before the, you, you signing the, like, uh, the next contract that you sign, it, 
it should result in a later publication because in all fairness to the first uh, like publisher, right? He the publisher wouldn't want to be like late with the publication, and uh, it may affect the estimation of sales and things like that. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank you. Uh, here's the next question: uh, What happens if a publisher falls? All right. That means you know comes to an end. Right. Uh, stops publishing. Uh, do the rights revert to the author? Is this necessary? Is it necessary to stipulate that in the contract? Mm, I think both of us not our heads. Yes, yeah. It's important to say that it should go back. <laughs> yeah, you should usually find it in the reversion clause. It, it, there will be a line that says, in the in a situation where the publisher goes bankrupt or whatever, whatever, you see language there. Right. Uh, the next question has to do with uh, digital or electronic rights. I think both of you make mention of it that it is uh, typical, right, in standard publishing contracts for the publisher to ask for these digital rights as well. Uh, is there anything you know particular about digital rights that you know authors should be on the lookout for in a contract? Hmm. I think for digital rights, because um, the pricing of a book is different, but even so, right, the production value. Uh, or rather the production cost of a digital book is less than a print copy typically because if you have say a digital uh, sale right can come on the same copy that has been produced so the publisher does one digital book and can sell it continuously but it must be very carefully considered what is the cost of producing this ebook and then uh, the sale will then be, uh, the production cost is then divided over the expected number of digital copies. And for a literary publisher like uh, Gordy Boy and Ethos, right, sometimes ebooks don't sell as well. So, so, so there are a few things to balance out. Firstly, is the retail price of the digital format. Secondly, is the expected sale of a digital format. Thirdly, is the production cost of a digital format. So how this plays out is that uh, it still must be very clear how much the author gets from the sale of a digital copy as compared to the sale of a print copy. And typically, the percentage from a digital sale is higher. So for example, if a digital book is sold, the author may get like say maybe two, three times more than a print book. I'm just stating some numbers, different publishers have different numbers, yeah. Yeah, uh, Kim, is that true too, you think, for uh, Gaudi Boy? That uh, author is going to get, uh, probably get a, a you know, a, a, better, a higher royalty from, a, from the sale of an electronic uh, copy rather than a print copy. But, you know, they may actually sell fewer electronic copies. Yes, absolutely. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with foreign rights. And the question has to do with uh, how are they sold? <laughs> how do publishers go about selling uh, foreign rights? You know, uh, I think uh, Kage used the word deputizing, <laughs> all right? Uh, you know, the author deputized the publisher, all right, to sell the rights, you know, to uh, foreign ter territories. Um, mm. How do your presses go about doing that? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I'll start first. Uh... Yeah, deputized because it sounds like very dignified, right? The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, the truth of the matter is we go and hawk our wares at sales uh, events called international book fairs. So, uh, uh, but uh, I would say that for independent publishers, we tend to go to book fairs where you find more like-minded publishers. I think today, uh, both of uh, our teams are independent presses in nature. We are very different from commercial animals that are like talking about maybe advances that are half a million pounds, things like that, you know, so we are not like that. So, so the, the economy that we uh, work in and the people we talk to are very different, but we will go to book fairs. So for example, uh, fairs like say regional fairs, like say uh, Hong Kong book fair is smaller in size, but there's a higher chance of matching. Yeah, and sometimes we can also work with a distribute a, a sort of agency to represent us for a market like China, which is very complex, right? It's very good to for a publishing house to work with an agency who would then talk to 
the different publishers in China. And when you talk to uh, like a foreign agency, the what they are doing is they are selling your book in other languages. So there is it is essentially a translation and publishing deal. And so that so we can sell rights directly in English, uh, assuming that's the language that is original to the work. And then we can also uh, sell rights in to other territories in other languages. Yeah. Uh, Kim, any more that? Uh... Yeah, no, all of that, you know, as you are right, as small, you know, indie presses, um, basically the, the way that foreign sales work is, you know, with connections, with like hawking, um, you know, you, you know of a lead, you, you, you email them, you send them your catalog, we discuss, we share, you build a relationship and, you know, that, that's, how, that's how it works. You know, Godly Boy, we're, we're, we're pretty young. We, I think we started in 2018, if I'm not wrong. So we are still waiting for our first foreign sale. Um, but that, that's basically how it works in the industry. Yeah, and you know, talking about, just to add to what Kim says, you know, um, talking about personal connections, certainly we've been very grateful for Ethos Books for actually selling us the rights, all right, to actually publish, you know, an American edition, right, of uh, certain of their titles. And that is part of the goal of the press, in fact, you know, to actually be able to uh, publish, you know, uh, American editions of uh, worth, worthy, you know, uh, good uh, Singapore literature in the US market. Um, okay, here is a question about negotiating uh, with a publisher for one's uh, author's rights. Yeah, uh, what if the publisher disagrees with me reserving my right to publish my work in other languages or countries, for example, or when I want to adapt my work in a, another form? Yeah, I think it's a question about negotiation. <laughs> what if you uh, you ask your publisher, right? You know, oh, I would like to reserve this right either to a territory, to a language, or to a format, and your publisher mm. said no. <laughs> How would you then, you know, go about negotiating it? Yeah, maybe uh, like I'm not sure whether Gerald has seen disputes of this nature. You can tell us a bit more later. But for a publishing house, right, we must have confidence in ourselves. To, to identify the right deals. So sometimes we do meet authors who also are very good at reaching out to people. And so there will be very uh, sort of, a, there'll be a disagreement. And that disagreement, right, how, uh, respect, the self-respecting publisher will stick to what they believe in. And maybe they will say that we can try something out together. And it will be good if like a, uh, there is a clause in a contract. If you know yourself to be this author, at the point of signing the contract, tell the publisher this, hey, you know something? I feel that I have very good contacts. Can we work out a clause so that if I secure the deal, then something more happens for me. That is doable. We have done contracts like that before, but that is only because of very exceptional cases because most authors, they, they are looking to us to help them to put the book out. Along the way, if an author becomes very good, which is entirely possible, and they find this publisher to be not so uh, like aligned in thinking anymore, that may also happen. But I think, uh, I think a contract, the spirit of the contract is that at the point of signing, we were both together. So during the like, course of the relationship, if the publisher has not done its part and you feel that it's not properly done, Hopefully, the contract allows for some consultation. So it will be good. That's why this session is good. So that if you feel that you're that kind of author who will really become very savvy, you might want to negotiate for a condition that will recognize your contribution to a deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, would uh, either Kim or Gerald want to come in on this? Yeah, I can add my two cents worth. So uh, unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately, I haven't seen disputes of, of this nature. Uh, and, and that's fundamentally because uh, of the value of the publishing contract. Um, you know, by the time you've got a team of lawyers on it, it it's more than 10 times like the, the value of the rights that you're talking about monetarily, of course, not, you know, emotionally as a poet, you know, I, we, we must think of the world of our work. So uh, that's fine. Um, 
but yeah, so I think it, uh, in, in terms of ne negotiations with publishers, yeah, I stand by what I said before. So um, you would obviously have difficult publishers and thankfully, I, you know, they're few and far between uh, based on what I've seen. Um, and uh, you would also have difficult authors. So it's not the case that, you know, every author proposing a new business venture or a new opportunity it is, it is sort of um, ha has adequately assessed that opportunity itself. Um, so I think it's really a matter of communication and, and un having you know, both parties understand where each other is coming from. And honestly, for me, when, when I look at you know, a, a standard uh, form contract uh, for you know, an anthology uh, where I've got a poem in, um, it, it's really just a red flag review. And, and I'm not going to make it the best case scenario for me. I'm not gonna spend 10 hours marking up the document so that you know, uh, and in the event that some sort of obscure contingency happens, I'll, I would be protected. That's not the spirit of the exercise. It's more like what I can live with as an author. So as long as I'm not signing up to a wide ranging indemnity you know, for like other works in the anthology or something like that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, and I think in terms of uh, the, the example that Kage gave on, you know, sort of, um, you know, pu publishers doing their part. And then if you want to um, expand the scope of work so that, you know, it includes, you know, other opportunities in future. Yeah, I think we can definitely provide for that in the, in the initial contract. And if not, um, because parties would want to sustain that working relationship, then just not going to be, you know, say like, okay, go away. We're not interested. Like, I'm sure that there would be some sort of communication involved. Um, and, and obviously from a publisher's perspective, um, if that additional opportunity also includes additional cost, then that's something that they have to weigh against. It's not just, you know, them saying no for no sake. It is the fact that, you know, it, it might cost them huge liabilities that the author might not have been privy to Thank you, Gerald. That's very, very useful. And if I may actually add one uh, specific example in uh, Gordy Boy's experience to what uh, Kage was saying about, you know, how, you know, a savvy author or th author with a connection may actually perhaps negotiate with a publisher. Uh, we have published, you know, a, a book of poems by a Filipino author based in Singapore, who when we were negotiating the contract actually asked us if she can actually remove the territory of the Philippines out of the contract because we ask usually ask for world rights. And that is because even though Gaudi Boy actually uh, publishes and distributes in Singapore, it would be far too expensive for most Filipino book customers to actually buy and ship the book from Singapore to the Philippines. And also the Philippine book market is very different. I mean, the, because of you know the lower cost of living, the cost of books are also much lower too. So it was not very profitable for us to sell directly all right, to the Philippines. Uh, so because of that, you know, we talked about it and we agreed, yes, we will leave it out, you know, so that you can act, we would no. what we did, we decided was that give us world rights for one year. And after that year, we will release the Philippine uh, territory to you so that you can actually seek a Filipino uh, publisher to publish it in the Philippine market. Yeah. So, you know, there is that give and take, all right, as long as, you know, we are in discussion and want to actually, of course, in both our uh, parties interest to maintain this working relationship. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move on now to the next group of uh, questions <laughs> about payments and royalties. See, I'm so used to reading poems online now. Uh, payments and royalties. Oh, here's a, here's a tough one. Uh, what would you consider a fair rate of payment an author can ask for? Uh, is there a standardized way of measuring the amount of money each manuscript is worth? For example, the number of pages. I, I think the, the first uh, term, the pages doesn't really matter, don't matter because uh, we know the Instagram poet sells so much more. But uh, in, I think worth is a very subjective term. I think for independent presses, the worth of a book inheres in the writing. And we take on a book uh, wanting to celebrate the worth of the book in literary terms. But the market values marriage very differently, unfortunately. So when we pay royalties, we cannot pay based on what we see as the worth of the manuscript, the literary worth, because we get paid for the book by the market. So, so I think the first thing is the, a publisher, how we do our calculation is we estimate the sale 
and we get a projected amount. We also know our internal costs. And after we work that out, we will know that we need to sell so many so-and-so books, how many copies to break even, meaning to just cover the time we spend on the book. And so when we, so currently for Ethos, right, our percentages are based on retail pricing, 4%, 8%, and 12%. And it increases based on the tiers. And this doesn't apply to all our contracts. So if a con- if I get a call from an author, hey, why are you talking about these numbers? I will explain, I, I will have to explain personally now because the numbers, right, depend on the work. So I see a question in the chat. Is it fair for a publisher to give one complimentary copy for a contribution to an anthology? Again, if the anthology costs a lot to produce in terms of time, and then we don't think it will sell a lot. So maybe this publisher can only afford to really give a complimentary copy. I'm not sure how it works out for this publisher, but sometimes there's an honorarium, but it's also a very small fee, $50, you know, but in the end, right, look at the track record of this publishing house. Is this publishing house like uh, doing things very uncharacteristically, uh, like uh, very uncharacteristic of how it has done other books in the catalogue? And then you can kind of determine whether, um, I think fairness is contextual and also uh, it it is based on like the specific party you are working with as well. Yeah, so... um, yeah, so to this question of uh, like royalties, I think I've given very fixed numbers for 8, 12% of retail price. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, just to piggyback on what Kage said, yes, it, it is very difficult to figure out what, right? Because exactly that as an indie press, the books that we publish are books that we believe in in terms of the work, you know, what, what the work is saying, what the reader gets out of it, the merit of it. Um, whereas how that translates to, you know, sales and interest in, uh, in the market is very different because not everyone is an indie publisher, not everyone is as interested uh, in in what we are interested in. So right, yeah, calculations have to be made, and um, you know, when we figure out advances or royalties, um, you know, we we have to also take into account. You know how much can we think? You know the the, the book itself. How 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 can we put put it out there? What what are the returns? And how can we do the best by the book? But also you know make sure that um you know the numbers add up because ultimately yeah you know we, we we want to stay we want to stay afloat and we want to make sure that we can you know that we are doing our homework in terms of the money the the math and the financials. Yeah, thank you so much, Kim. Um, sorry, uh, Hannah, she actually had a question in chat, which is a uh, really thing to write. So I'm going to, you know, uh, go back to rights for a moment. Um, and she asks, uh, would publishers allow authors to separately market their works on social media platforms or through merchandise? Now, I do not know whether Hannah can actually uh, clarify what uh, you mean by market. Right, because of course, if you're talking about you know promoting the book that has been published by your publisher, you know, I think publishers are more than happy, right? That authors would actually, you know, be active in promoting the books that have been published by the publisher. But if by marketing, uh, you are suggesting that you know uh to make available your work and to sell your work, all right, separately, all right, uh from the book put out by your publisher on social media and platforms. Uh, that again, I would imagine, go back to the contract that you have with your publisher, right? Whether you have granted your publisher exclusive rights, right? In which case, of course, you cannot actually be publishing your uh, work and selling your work in any other, in other formats or otherwise, you know, uh, uh, non-exclusive rights, in which case, of course, you can do so. Is that your same understanding too, uh, Kage and uh, Kim? It's, it yeah. seems to be the case. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I'll share, sharing quickly, you know, like when I used to work on my previous publisher, 
we would publish a lot of um, cookbooks um, and we would and these were recipes that were already published on blogs before um, and you know a lot of our authors were you know uh, like very media social media savvy you know posting their recipes online and doing all that sorts of stuff so if Again, once again, it's like, you know, when you, if you know you have a strength in a certain area and that let's say it's your livelihood or something like that, you want to be able to try to build it in the contract negotiations. So let's say you're like, hey, you know, what? I, I publish my recipes online as well. This is how I make my money. But I also want to put some of the recipes in this book. C can we figure out language that accommodates for that? You know, maybe a certain percentage of the recipes online are in the book and like, are you okay with that publisher? And, you know, you, you work out some language that allows you to continue to do your thing while also, you know, making sure that the publisher is, is okay with it and can still find a way to sell a book and not, you know, be like, well, if there's 50% of the, of the recipes on your blog, there will be no return for a cookbook. So you just want to, you know, be able to negotiate that. So, it, you know, a good, a fair publisher, I think, would have these, you know, negotiations in good faith and understand where the author is coming from. Yeah, I second that. Uh, and the idea of good faith extends to understanding how each person does their work. Because, um, for example, marketing is about timing and sequence as well. So if, if you want to create a certain effect, right, there must be a certain logic and flow to the marketing. And if the author has a campaign that is very separate from the book campaign, it may actually be counterproductive. So, so I, I think uh, the language that uh, Kim, you refer to, can also accommodate for how such coordination can happen. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. And uh, Zainon and Ahari, I do see your questions, but I'm going to uh, uh, um, ask them when we come to uh, a group of other questions that are related, all right, about marketing and distribution and so forth. Uh, here is another question about rights, still, by Tina. If I assign publishing rights to a publisher on a book about cats, to what extent can I still write about cats? Because cat is a universal subject and there are so many aspects of it. How different would new content have to be? What has to be considered? I think I think uh, maybe I think Gerald, you later you can uh, like clarify if I'm not as uh, specific. But I know that uh, say when we take on a publishing contract, right? We and the work is the specified format and con uh, that that specified format is what is governed by the contract. So if you write about a cat, like, like uh, being uh, very like uh, lazy and like uh, doing a lot of lazy things, and but then in another book, you write about this cat being lazy in other ways, I don't think you, you should stop writing about this other book. I think it's not the same book. Is that correct, Gerald? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, so. As a, now speaking as a writer, uh, the, the standard publication process would be we submit manuscripts to a publisher. Um, and then, um, so in, in my uh, case, Kage as well. So once, once they agree to publish, um, then uh, the, the, the work itself will be defined as a defined term in the uh, publishing contract. And that would refer to the manuscript that's been edited, you know, with input from uh, the publishing team as well as the author. So that is the work that um, to which publishing rights have been granted to the publisher. So it's a it, it's it's rights that um, are in relation to a specified work um, that's you know in a word form or PDF. It's not uh, rights in relation to a particular subject. So you can write you know ad infinitum on on any subject that you want um, that's outside of that PDF or, or word document that you've submitted to uh, the publisher itself. Great, thank you so much, Gerald. I think that was a very clear uh, explanation. Uh, now going back to where we were, which is about payments and royalties, we have a question about advances, all right, for the publishers. Uh, are authors always paid advances? What is your practice? For Ethos, right, we have not paid advances until this year. Uh, and uh, it's a practice that we want to continue. Uh, but not all book contracts 
Yeah, so it has to be very specific because as I mentioned, we have to consider each project separately. And, uh, but I think why we want to move towards paying advances is because our team firmly believes that just like we want to make a livelihood, authors want to make a livelihood. And if you just wait for like royalties without an advance, right? By the time you get your advance, uh, your royalties, I think, wow, it doesn't seem like you are living a life, you know. So, so I think uh, we want to move there, but I think we have to do this incrementally so it can't be applied across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Same. Um, you know, for Gaudi Boy, we do pay advances. Um. Uh, but yes, you know, uh, just as Kage said, there are some books that not all books. Uh, would have an advance. For example, you know, let's say if we are, um, it's we are commissioning, you know, an editor or anthology editor to to gather works, to put them together. You know, um, maybe we would discuss a work for hire, which would be a one-time fee and then not an advance. And and they're different. You know, once again, a one-time fee is you pay, you, you get the fee, you are paid for your services, and you're and you're done. Whereas an advance is a it's against royalty. So it's kind of like, you know, here's the money first. And as you collect royalties, they are adding up to that, that advance. And that's why you're only paid royalties after the advance is recouped. So it depends on the, the, the type of project. Um, yes, uh, um, it, you, you just have to see once again, you know, that is the work that I'm pro providing, that does it fit, you know, the advance model or not? Uh, but am I hearing from both of you that, you know, it's a good idea if, you know, advances are not given all the time, that it's a good idea to move towards giving advances, right, to recognize, you know, um, you know, um, the work of Yes, people. I think yes. it's... it's okay, advances are pretty, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, um, for big publishers, I understand for smaller publishers, sometimes, you know, if you're strapped for resources, you're, you're giving out money, you know, before you can recoup. And that's what we, you know, at God Boy did in the beginning. We we're like, okay, um, here's our first book contract. You know, here's the advance. We, had, we have not made any money. But for bigger publishers, you know, definitely advance is standard industry model. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, let me follow up uh, that with a question about royalties then, all right? Uh, because they go together, right? Advances and royalties. Uh, what are your standard royalties? And how are they split between publisher and author? Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding here, right? Royalties go to the author, all right, paid by the uh, publisher. Uh, do you want to say something about the royalties? Maybe the concept of royalty we can explain a bit, because it seems like a definition that uh, we can all be very direct about. So, so when you sell a book, the book is uh, say maybe $10. And then the bookshop may take $4 or $5, it depends. The remaining $5, right, will then be what the publisher has to pay for printing, design, uh, the, like, uh, um, the author, and also your, our own upkeep. So, so that percentage that goes to the author is called the royalty. Yeah. So this percentage, uh, just now I mentioned, right, the range can be from 4 to 12% and it's dependent on the book and also the tier and the number of copies, a lot of factors, right? So, so when you say that royalties are split, I think you're, say, you're in fact saying that the revenue from the sale is being split and the part that goes to you is the royalty. And maybe you're concerned about the percentage that goes to you. And I think that's what we are saying that, you know, the numbers I'm saying that refers to the percentage of the revenue that's going to you as the author. Yeah. Uh, Kim, you want to jump in on this? Um, yeah, something else I guess to also distinguish and you might uh, appear, this might appear in some of your contracts is royalties on net receipts and royalties of retail price. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> Kage, am I right to say that, you know, what you're describing earlier is royalties of net receipts? Uh, that's right. Actually, the royalty, right, that you calculate is based on after you have deducted the costs. Yeah. 
So that is the part that goes to the author. Yes. 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 So, so you know, it is very standard in publishing as well to have both. Uh, it, it really depends. It, there, there's not one that's you know better than the other uh, because all, all books are different, and you know, a book that uh, sells a lot could you know make more than the other system and blah 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 whatever. But basically, the two systems are there's net receipt, which is what Kage just described, and then there's also royalties of retail price. Um, which is basically the fixed retail price is there and you give um, an author, you know, uh, the royalty percentage based off the retail price, um, which would be, you know, um, however much the book costs. Right. Uh, thank you, both of you. Um, I think the earlier question about payment uh, to the contributors of an anthology, Kage has already answered that. Uh, partly, right? I think the question was whether it's fair to actually pay the contributors to an anthology just uh, in kind a uh, copy of the book rather than mm -hmm. receiving any kind of payments. And I think yeah. I heard uh, Kage say, of course, you know, that very much depends on the anthology, isn't it? Right? Because sometimes yeah. even to get that anthology published, it would involve so much cost. And if not many copies are actually going to be sold, you know, what the publisher can offer may be all right as uh you know just a, a copy all right of the book but i think you also uh want us uh kage that you know you want to keep looking at the publisher's uh, tr uh track record yeah? yeah uh because that is can also be very very telling if uh you know if that is all the time done even for anthologies that are selling very very well yeah uh, that should be a red flag am i right kage Yes, I think that is uh, absolutely how, what I have in mind. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, we also have a question here that's related to payment by Eleanor. Uh, she asks, uh, regarding projects that require many photographs, such as a book on architecture or cooking, is it standard for the publisher to ask the author to pay for all the costs? I guess it means the cost of the photographs. Yeah, we typically when we get manuscripts with photos, right, it, they come together. Yeah, so so I am not, uh, the projects that uh, require photos to be taken, uh, in fact, um, I, don't, I don't think I can recollect any instance, you know, when we have to take more photos than what was already submitted. Yeah, so I think we can consider this as a hypothetical for ethos. Yeah, I'm not sure about Gaudi Boy, yeah. We, we don't have we don't have such books yet as well uh, but also you know having worked at the previous company that did quite a lot of those books if let's say you are working with a publisher and you know that publisher put, produces a lot of coffee table books these kinds of books that like rely a lot on photographs and you and you know they're I, I don't know what the situation is I don't know whether they approached you and asked you to you know write this book, for them or whether you had a complete manuscript and you're submitting it to the publisher I think so I think it would depend but let's say the publisher has approached you and is commissioning the work then I think it would be pretty a, a good idea to in your negotiation say hey so you want me to produce this book can we include a fee or a stipend or something for the, the, the photographs that I'm trying to like to, to get for you Mm. especially if they're a publisher that does this all the time you know if right if they're a publisher like us or like ethos where it's not really our wheelhouse you know um me, me, you know we for Gaudi boy at least like i don't think you know we would have the resources to do that which is why we don't commission such books yes i think uh very similar i find that our strategies and our thinking are very similar probably because of the scale of our operations so uh what i would say is that then this publisher, we may even say that maybe you need to find another publisher who can do this with you because you need to find a publisher who can pay for the photos. But it could be that you want to work with a publishing house and you say, I will undertake the cost. So again, that good faith would have to be in evidence because uh, the worst is you go with a publisher you don't like and then the publisher asks you to pay everything and you end up feeling very cheated. Then that's not even a good arrangement not to say a contract, yeah. Right, thank you. Now I think we'll move on to a uh, next group of uh, 
uh, questions about you know marketing and distribution. Yeah. Um, here's the question about print runs, right? How are print runs uh, decided? And do they vary across genres? And here I will fold in uh, Zainon's uh, question. Uh, she's asking a question about young adult novel. Is 100 copies for the first print run of a young adult novel kind of standard or fair? I think Zainon mentioned 1,000 copies. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm, okay. So, uh... I think uh, genres, right, uh, they are tied to market, uh, meaning the readership number. So, and it's specific to the territory. So in Singapore, uh, say um, for a poetry book, uh, I remember, Gerald, we printed 500 copies for Intruder. Yeah, so lovely. Yeah, there, there's still 499 left. So <laughs> please do that. support and, and buy the book. <laughs> You turn this into a marketing session, well done. Yeah, no, but uh, there's definitely not like 499 copies, Gerald. It's 498 copies, okay? Yeah. So, uh, well, I think uh, for poetry books, typically the numbers would be about 500. For a novel, I think uh, it could even be 500 to 1,000, depending on the, the kind of uh, like uh, marketing we can imagine for the author and I use these words very uh, creatively in the sense that imagining because marketing is also about belief and the author and the team must be aligned so actually that's the magic of publishing which I want to bring a bit into this conversation because talking about contracts and all it makes me feel very shriveled and tired sometimes you know because it's so defensive and oh my gosh it's like but we have to do it because uh, you may come into a situation that is not defined and that's why we need lawyers like Gerald so this is the most important thing I feel that the uh, when the team and the author are aligned magic can happen then the print run right we will say let's go for even more you know that kind of thing so so it is actually wonderful if the author can feel inspired by a publisher to give the best and then it will affect the print run seriously because the team has that belief in you. But if you come into a, a agreement not liking the publisher, right, it's very likely that the publisher will lose certain confidence and it will also affect the print run. So the standard is there, 500 for maybe poetry, 1000 for novels, but, but then it also can be sort of affected by such, I would say, very human factors. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Kage. Did you mention also uh, the young for young adult fiction? Ah, okay. Young adult novel, right? Um, it depends on the subject matter because I find that um, the the kind of uh, like young adult novels that we have worked with before, it maybe sold in the end about eight hundred copies. So, but I don't think it would have happened with another book. So it may be less than that. So I really can't, I think it's not very easy to say. Uh, so Zainan, um, sorry, we can't really tell until we see the manuscript also. Yeah. Uh, she has just elaborated by saying it's a young adult novel uh, and it's a historical fiction. Uh, Kim, uh, is any bell ringing? Like, because... <laughs> Yeah. If we don't do young adult uh, at yet, or maybe one day we'll find a great young adult manuscript, but we haven't, so I don't, I don't have uh, any expertise on that. Mm. And we don't, uh, Gaudi Boy doesn't do print run uh, as well, uh, because we actually uh, print, uh, we do print, uh, our books are printed on print on demand uh, platforms. Yeah, uh, Ingram uh, in the US, uh, page by print in Singapore. So in other words, when your order or my order from a customer goes in, uh, the books are then printed on the spot and delivered to you. Uh, that actually yeah. saves uh, Gaudi Boy, you know, warehouse costs. Yeah. There's a whole other thing that, that you have to deal with, Cargate. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> uh, no, my colleagues do it. That's how. <laughs> Yeah, okay. But uh, Zainan, I think historical fiction for young adults, right? It's also the styling of it. So um, I remember talking to some authors, right? And then uh, they were very clear about their vision. But their vision, right, entails the reader to take a step out of comfort zone. 
So that means that it may not be immediately accessible. So in that instance, right, the publisher may have to like rethink the print run. But when a publisher commits to publishing you, right, typically it's already a vote of confidence, I would say. Unless it's some very weird like Stockholm syndrome thing going on, which I hope not. But it is really a mutual agreement. So so the hopefully the, the print run reflects that. Uh, mutual trust as well. Yeah, so that's what I can say at, at the least. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a question uh, after talking about prints, right? Talking about marketing, right? How are you going to sell the books that have been printed? Yeah. Uh, the question that came in uh, was what are fair marketing and promotional terms in the contract? Uh, which I take to mean. How much can an author expect a publisher to market and promote their work? Mm. I'm very happy to go second, but I can go first also. <laughs> you tell um, me. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering again this question directly because it's so general, but I wonder if this ties in with Hari's question. Um, in terms of publicity, well, publicity, marketing also, there's a bit of a, but in terms of publicity, how much creative input influence does an author have on the work's marketing? Does the publisher call the shots in the department or is it a consensus-based deal? So at least for Gaudi Boy, you know, um, we have language in the contract that, you know, like I shared, the publicity clause that states, it, once again, it's kind of very dry and cut things. It states that, you know, we have, we want to be able to use the author's likeness to market the book. We want to be able to excerpt X amount of words in, you know, in, in, in a journal or something to help, you know, promote the book and create buzz. But, you know, what isn't actually stipulated in the contract, but that, you know, we discuss with the authors outside of the contract as well is how to work together to market and publicize the book. You know, and like Kage said, once, you know, there's alignment there where, you know, the publisher and the author would, you know, meet maybe share ideas over email whatever it is on how to their ideas on how to market the book and if there's alignment then yeah that the magic can really happen where um the author says i have all these leads i'm going to pursue them the publisher has all these other industry leads they're going to pursue them you're working together so at least for Gaudi boy we do really want our authors to be exactly like harry said equal equally in you know i think it is very difficult for a publisher to just take the marketing role and run with it and the, and the author just sits you know and sits at home and um, doesn't do much as well because you know you're a, the proponent of the book and you are the the image and the voice of the book so the publisher i think would also want to rely a lot on your your input and your efforts and your voice at least that's how it is for Gaudi boy I, I don't know if there are other publishing companies who are like no we want to do everything ourselves i i'm not sure i've ever come across that i, I feel like at least right now a lot of publishing companies are um expecting and you know uh, asking their, their their authors to put in the work especially if let's say the author has a huge social media following in some of the bigger publishing houses you know that's something that a publisher really looks to and wants the author to uh, be a proponent of yeah uh, kim if i can follow up very quickly what you're saying do you do you see now you know us publishers you know uh, because that's the scene you're most familiar with now kind of, you know, insisting or encouraging, right? However, the language is for the authors to have, for example, you know, professional looking author websites, right? Do they now require authors to have that or to require authors to have Instagram accounts, all right? Or to have Twitter accounts and things like that. Do you see that as really becoming a trend? I, for the bigger publish, I think so. I, I don't think it's in contract. I don't think they have language that says, you need this account. But I think that's very much the expectation and very much also colors in, for bigger, pub, for bigger companies, it affects whether they, they accept the manuscript. If they see, oh, you know, this is a, a great work, but the, the following count is, eh, I'm not sure if this author can market themselves. It, it is possible that it actually affects their decision. And it's something that I think smaller indie press want to try to avoid, right? right? We are about the work. We are not about the author's followers. We want to stay true to that. And I think, you know, we try our best to do. That's why we don't have these um, requirements. Um, but as a trend, I think that's definitely what you see in the platformed books. 
in, in the books that are getting all the marketing and all, all the attention. Yeah, and also about, you know, what the publisher can do for a book. Um, would you like to share something about, you know, what Gaudi Boys, you know, put aside as a budget for uh, awards and uh, for book launches? So for Gaudi Boy, you know, we, we have about a $600 budget for marketing and publicity and awards. And basically what we do is, you know, um, we give the author an author questionnaire, um, kind of asking them what their vision for the book is, you know, uh, if they have any leads and they want to share with us, well, what, how they, you know, basically asking them for their marketing vision. We take the author questionnaire, you know, we discuss it as a team, and then we reach out to media. Um, we uh, reach out to academic institutions to see if they want to carry the book. We plan a book launch, um, whether it's in person or in Zoom because of uh, COVID. And then we also submit the book to awards. You know, we research awards, we figure out what, you know, fits um, the book and you know we get the word out as well in that in that way um, so you know we we know we, we do a lot of the work as well but that also comes from the author's author questionnaire which you know we, it forms the basis of our marketing plan thank you Kim uh, Kage you want to talk about ethos yeah, I think what uh, I noticed a very useful difference to point out is in our contract, we don't really have a marketing clause. And that's more historical reasons. Uh, the fact is that when we, I think uh, my forebears started publishing, right? They, they were just, let's make the book. And then everybody was just happy. And then the marketing side was actually a secondary concern. And they, but they were doing things out there, but it's not an active concern. And so our contract today still don't have a marketing clause. And I, I think it's a very important point to note that even if something is not in the market, in a contract, doesn't mean that it will not be done. But when should we put something into a contract is a question that the publisher needs to ask. For us, right, we do very similar things like what Gordy Boy is saying, but it's not in the contract. The questionnaire, my colleagues do that. And then they run a marketing campaign, pre-orders leading to the launch, post-launch like launch events, things like that. But uh, it's not really stipulated in the contract. If you ask me, do we want to do that? I'm not sure because sometimes I think I want to reduce the number of clauses in the contract and slowly over time make it streamlined so that when an author looks at it, it's not scary because... It looks really scary, a contract sometimes, but how do we make it fair, firm, and still not scary? So, so adding a clause to me also, is it going to change how we work? Not really. So I'm not sure if we're going to add that clause, but I totally respect what Godiboy has done because it adds certainty. And yeah, so that's why I still think that even after a session like this and many more sessions like this, it may be that you still see different contracts because there are so many different ways of uh, like thinking about how to uh, do good work and enshrine that work yeah in a contract yeah yeah definitely i want to quickly add on to what kagi said also just in general and i don't know if this actually applies across the board but just for me if i see a contract that's really long and really wordy that automatically is kind of already a red flag um, again, it's very general. I don't know if this applies to everyone, but it just seems that if you can simplify and streamline your contract and say everything in this in succinct words, you you don't we want to be leery of you know, I don't know, fifteen page contracts or how, however many they would be. Luckily, ours is less than fifteen pages. I actually didn't count. I didn't count our page of contract, so maybe the number is wrong. But basically, yeah. <laughs> Right, thank you. I just want to very quickly clarify also what you know Kim said about Gaudi Boy and that you know what is in the contract is really you know things like the right to use the author's image, you know, and excerpting and things like that. The other things that Kim mentioned, like the author or the author questionnaire and stuff like that, what we have done is that instead of putting it in the contract, and we agree with Kage that it seems very cut and dried when it's put into the contract. Instead of putting that into the contract, we've actually put it in what we call a love letter to our authors, <laughs> which is our way of telling them all, right, all the various ways, you know, that may not be specified in the contract, but all the various ways in which we would support the author, you know, in promoting and marketing that book and all the various ways too, the author can actually, you know, uh, help us.
in that promoting and marketing that book. So it seems less, you know, daunting because it's not put in legal language, but actually put in a, a separate document. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question here, I think uh, quite specific uh, from Ruchika in the chat. Uh, if an author reads from their book at an event, not affiliated with the book's marketing plan, presumably the author has found this uh, uh, reading uh, themselves, and not organized by the publisher, is there a reading fee? And is this covered in the contract? I see. So in a way, uh, this question is, will the author, can the author get paid uh, for doing an event that is not organized by the publisher? And I think, um, I don't think we have such a clause. Uh, and I don't know whether we will want to like uh, standardize such a clause because uh, uh, it will be very prohibitive if you are a very popular author. It's very scary to sign you on already because we will be uh, not sure whether we can take you on. So it may actually, uh, so I would say that um, is if you want and envision such a contract, it will mean that it will kind of uh, like attract certain types of publishers, I would say. Who, who are also able to kind of cover that. I'm not really sure if there's such a term uh, in most contracts, to be honest. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, most publishers would not pay for events that, you know, are not organized by publishers. Uh, but perhaps, you know, you can actually look to the event organizer to pay you right, for reading. Uh, more and more, I think, you know, um, in terms of the professionalization you know, of the literary uh, industry, uh, people should be paid for their work. All right, so they should not have to actually be doing a reading. All right, uh, without uh, getting paid for it, because of course time, talent, and effort is actually involved uh, in such events. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to just to add to that very quickly, um, mm -hmm. it stems from the nature of the relationship between publisher and writer. So. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about um, assigning just publishing rights, so not transferring copyright to the publisher, the, the publisher is fundamentally responsible for bringing that work to which you hold copyright into the world, uh, but you're not um, by virtue of that contract, an employee of the publisher or an agent of the publisher, and you, you are still the author of the work. So it's not like you're no longer responsible for it, uh, right? And I think it, as writers, it's important for us to be responsible for, for our work and to hold, you know, a certain, uh, so we spoke about certain rights that shouldn't be assigned to anyone else. Um, but, but because of this nature of relationship, then um, it wouldn't make sense for the publishers to pay us for, you know, every event that we do uh, when we are reading from the work that's been published by them. Um, it's in both of our interests, not just the publisher's interest, um, for writers to go out and sell their work um, and to appear at festivals, etc. So um, in that sense, I guess, if we think about, again, you know, like, I guess a capitalist like ideology of what, 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 what money represents, it represents um, some sort of return for a service. We're, we're not giving the publisher a service if, if, if we read from our own work because we are directly benefiting from that exposure and that marketing as well. Thank you so much, uh, Gerald, for saying that. Uh, let's go on to another question in the chat, which is from uh, Gabriel O. Uh, if an author wishes to be published under a pen name, will the contract be made under a pen name or the author's real name? And are there any other considerations in such circumstances, uh, you know, assuming that the author prefers to be referred to by their pen name? I think uh, as a legal contract, uh, it has to be made out in the legal name. It's just that you can have a clause in the contract stipulating the pseudonym to be published. Yeah. And also you don't want to sign a contract under an, a pseudonym because it means that you're not actually like uh, bound by the contract. And it means that the benefits of the contract cannot be given to you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right, uh, and then there's another question from Hannes uh, in a, a below in the same chat. Uh, if an author changes publisher who produced the manuscript, cover design, etc., to another publisher or self-publishers, 
do they get the files to reprint or do they have to make a new one of their own? Uh, technically uh, and legally, uh, you have to have that file done by the new publisher. Also because right that the publisher is responsible for the work done uh, on the manuscript. And if it's circulated out there and people ascribe whether good or bad things to that republished manuscript, to that, there should be a very clean relation, uh, cut from the old publisher to the new publisher. So reusing of files doesn't establish that clean, clean cut. I, I think that is from a good sense point of view. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, now we've uh, more or less tackled the questions about payments as well as, you know, marketing and distribution. Let's talk about indemnity clauses. All right, uh, because I think that's a big topic for some of us here. Uh, so what are your standard indemnity clauses and why? Why do you have such clauses? Uh, the main indemnity that we ask of the author is... Uh, going ahead because i did mention to you at the start of this session that we also had a clause indemnifying us from damages due to maybe content that are seen to be libelous defamatory things like that but we found that to be something that we inherited and we continue uh in good faith we have never exercised that clause so we so so after a while, we thought that hey, we are behaving a bit like uh, a, some like uh, uh, governments, right, where they leave a law in and they don't use it. So we don't really want to do that. So so we took that out. But what remains, right, is that we put we still have the like a uh, copy, uh, say, uh, like um, what do you call it? No plagiarism, and. So I think that is a very basic thing. If you have copied and you didn't declare it to us and it becomes a problem later and we are sued for it, we cannot handle that. So, so I think that is a very clear-cut indemnity that we ask for. Yeah. Uh, Kim, you yeah. want to take that as well? Sure, sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, this discussion on indemnity, indemnity actually, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that we had this little, like, a session for us because I think this is something that is alerting us to perhaps the need to revise and, and take a look at what our indemnity clause is. Um, you know, we are a small team and we don't have legal, uh, we don't have, like, you know, our own team of legal advisors. So I guess, you know, um, when, you know, reading the clause, that we have never also ourselves practiced in good faith. You know, I thought, oh, it's it's great, just you know, we can just leave it in. But it's right. If let's say an indemnity clause covers seems to cover everything and not specify certain conditions for, for the coverage, it can be very risky to the author. Um, you know, in the indemnity clause, you want to, I guess, if you want to be specific, you want to make sure that it is applied only when any suits that are filed against you do go through and it, it has been proven that the author has indeed breached their warranties, ha has indeed breached the promise that they did declare in the contract. Um, there are some indemnity clauses out there that don't even specify. So any suit that is filed, even if nothing was proven or you know, it, it didn't even go to court, they can just you know, use this clause to cover any um, financial damages they received and charge it to the author, which of course is not fair. So you know, when you look at those clauses, you just want to make sure that it is specific and that it is fair to the author and also to the publisher who does need to have some language to cover themselves in the, in the case of a serious you know, plagiarism case. Um, so yeah, no, in, in, in that situation, you know, for us, Gaudi Boy, I think, you know, we will want to like take a look, take a closer look at our indemnity clause and see if there are any ways that we can be more specific the language so that we are fair to the authors. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that uh, maybe it would be a fair principle to apply where the author should not be responsible for what is beyond the author's control. 
but this is a very like a generic principle so then we have to apply this principle in a very specific way to a very specific context say for single author works for anthologies so if say uh, we, the, the four of us, we actually had a chat before this and we were saying that, well, if you, if say um, like an author is asked to be responsible for the collection of works that he or she is a part of, then that doesn't make sense because the author only has contributed one work. So the author cannot be responsible for responsible for the entire collection. So things like that, I would say it's not fair. Yeah. yeah Gerald, you want to come in on this question? Yeah, no, that, that I think um, Kim and uh, Kage really hit the nail on the head. Um, it, it's all about control for me. So uh, I asked myself whether, um, does the indemnity cover a, a set of circumstances which I have control over? So if it's, you know, the fact that um, I, I claim to be the author and owner of my work, but actually I'm not. That's something that I have control over. And, and it, I would be, you know, um, uh, open to other types of illegal uh, behaviors, like if, if not just in that publishing contract alone, but it's illegal, illegal to, you know, hold yourself out to be owning something that you don't. Um, so that's something that we've got control over. That's fine if we have an indemnity for it, but then say in, in the specific example that uh, Kage mentioned about the fact that if I'm just one of the contributing um, uh, writers to an anthology, then it doesn't make sense for me to um, uh, be in, to indemnify the publisher for um, the works that aren't mine in that anthology. And that's because I don't have any control over, you know, I, I don't know, there's no, it, it's impossible. And, and also um, it, it's not appropriate for, for one writer to, you know, interrogate the rest of the contributing writers to say, oh, are you actually the, the writer of, of that work? So I think um, indemnities um, generally resistant to them, but where they make sense, i.e. they stem from a set of circumstances um, uh, to which we've got control over. I think it, it, it's entirely appropriate. And if we put ourselves in the publisher's shoes as well, like they would definitely want to, um, if I were publisher, I would want to be indemnified against any loss for some, you know, rogue writer claiming that, um, you know, they've got a uh, copyright to their work, but actually they don't. And we've seen that in the past as well in Singapore. I think there are a couple of rogue ones claiming that, you know, they've authored certain works which were actually plagiarized. So if you're publishing those works, obviously, you know, you wouldn't want your bank account to bleed dry just because, you know, an author has been fraudulent. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're coming almost to two hours. <laughs> I want to thank you, our panelists, you know, for, for your, your great, you know, um, generosity in giving us you know, your time as well as all your thoughts. So I, maybe we can just um, cover a couple of very, very, you know, straightforward questions that you came in, you know, uh, prior the event, you know, so that, you know, people can have their questions answered. Uh, and then we can actually wrap up, all right? So here are a couple and anybody can just take them, all right? Uh, what is the timeline between signing a contract and releasing the book, all right? Anybody? Yeah, for us, it could be between one to even two years, depending on the complexity of the work required on editing, yeah, and uh, maybe, yeah, some other design factors maybe. About the same time, yes. Okay. You, you know, usually we try to be uh, quicker with that, you know, the work coming out a year from now. But in our contract, we do stipulate, I believe, 18 months from signing or from re receiving the manuscript to publication. But, you know, also it's, sometimes it's, it's, it may not also be the publisher's interest to delay. Um, we want to get the book out as soon as possible and, you know, uh, get, get uh, get it sold. So it, it, it really depends. Like, you know, once again, the language is just there to cover a scenario in which there is a delay. But typically, it doesn't mean that if at 18 months is in the contract, that means the publisher is going to wait until the 18th month to do it. Okay. Thank you very much. And here's another very straightforward question, I think. <laughs> uh, are authors supposed to pay the publishing house for publishing their work? That is another model of publishing. Uh, I believe Gaudi Boy and Ethos, we don't do that. Yeah. But if you go to a commercial publisher who does commission works, then 
there is that kind of arrangement. And I believe there's also an in-between, I can't remember the term for that, where it's cost sharing. Yeah. So yeah, but for Ethos and Gaudi Boy, yeah, I see we all are similar. Mm. We don't. Okay. Right. I, I believe we have actually, you know, uh, answered most of the questions <laughs> that you have actually sent us. Uh, please pardon us if we, you know, did not manage to quite get to your question, uh, but it is two hours <laughs> and it's been a very long session. Thank you uh, everyone for actually st who are still here and staying with us. I, we really, really hope that this uh, session has proved to be informative and useful to you. Uh, but we especially want to thank our panelists, you know, uh, for their participation uh, in this panel, really out of goodwill. Um, because, you know, I think they have uh, so much knowledge to share and they have actually shared it so uh, generously. So thank you very much, Kage, uh, Ethos Boka, for uh, sharing your expertise and the spirit of uh, uh, behind your publishing house. Thank you so much, you know, Kimberly for being so patient with explaining every single detail and exceptions and so forth and being so thoughtful about, you know, about, you know, possibilities and eventualities. Uh, and thank you so much, Gerald. I mean, uh, really very illuminating <laughs> legal uh, perspective. And again and again, you help us to see things, you know, as uh, a lawyer would. And we want to actually have that, of course, in uh, events about publishing contracts. So, um, thank you, everybody. And um, unless any um, yeah. panelists have any last words you want to say to our guests? Uh, to you. Thank you, Ji Leong. Actually, this session came about because Ji sent an email to Ethos and said that we have to do this because uh, it's a good time to show that there's goodwill in our community as well. And then uh, I also think that my teammates were very supportive uh, in this process. So. Uh, thank you to my colleagues as well. So, G, Kim, Gerald, wow, I actually thought I enjoyed this more than I expected, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I echo what you said, uh, Kage, we really do want to foster, you know, goodwill within the community. There's a lot of goodwill within the community uh, and, you know, a lot of uh, desire to actually support and, you know, encourage one another. And this is only just one of the many ways. Right, we're going to uh, bid everybody farewell now. All right, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Goodbye for now. Okay.